Hi guys and welcome to Sovereign Financials. This is our first video here and we're going to try to make this channel go over lots of different uh, financial topics. Today we're going to kind of talk about why I believe there may be a market crash in 2018 to 2019. First, let's consider the direction the Federal Reserve has taken the economy and their plans for the future. So there's something called quantitative easing, and what quantitative easing is, is basically the government printing an extraordinary amount of money to buy a bunch of assets. And they've been basically printing money to buy a bunch of assets, including securities that are usually been mortgage-backed securities. Um, basically, when people buy a house, they get a loan from the bank, and then when those loans aren't doing so well, the Federal Reserve has been buying those loans from the banks. They also buy bonds and treasury notes, and this is called quantitative easing, and what this does is it boosts asset prices. The Federal Reserve has done three rounds of quantitative easing, and as you can see in this graph here, you can see that uh, basically a bunch of, here's 2008 crash, and then the Federal Reserve printed a bunch of money to buy a bunch of assets up, and this graph here shows their balance sheet, which is basically the total amount of assets that the Federal Reserve has purchased in order to keep the stock market boosted. So as you can see here, the Fed greatly boosted their balance sheet after the 2008 market crash uh, and doubled it in order to keep the housing market boosted up a bit and not let all asset prices crash, even though there was still a pretty significant crash. The Federal Reserve since then has done a couple more rounds, two more rounds of quantitative easing in which they basically purchased a bunch of assets by printing a bunch of money out of nowhere and to keep everything boosted up. If you take a look here at the graph, in a little bit after 2014, the Federal Reserve stopped uh, performing quantitative easing, and now the balance sheet is over $4 trillion. Uh, this chart is measured in millions of uh, millions. Um, and then in 2017, the Federal Reserve announced that they were going to begin to allow $30, million, oh, sorry, $30 billion worth of treasuries to mature per month without repurchasing them. And what that does is it allows $30 billion of treasury notes are essentially are being sold per month by the Federal Reserve in an effort to start bringing this balance sheet back down to what they would consider to be a more uh, reasonable level. If the Federal Reserve is starting to sell you know, $30 billion worth a month of assets, this ends up putting negative pressure on assets. This includes stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and uh, mortgages, or specifically houses. Um, and then with this negative pressure, you might start seeing asset prices come down. The Federal Reserve has also been hiking rates uh, with three rate hikes performed in 2017 and then two rate hikes in 2018 with an additional two more rate hikes this year. And when you have increasing interest rates, this also applies a, a downward pressure on all assets because people aren't able to take out loans to buy uh, more expensive products. Companies can't take out loans to expand their business. You know, uh, people can't take out loans to get a bigger mortgage. And then a lot of these things, uh, the assets start coming down. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the, my next uh, graph here. This is something called the Schiller P.E. ratio. The Schiller P.E. ratio essentially looks at, it, it tries to value stocks. It takes basically their earnings over the past 10 years and also their prices over the last 10 years, um, something that's known as the price to earnings ratio, and or initially um, by itself in a single year is a price to earnings ratio. And if you roll that over 10 years, that's called the Schiller P.E. ratio. And what that does is it tries to tell you how expensive the stock is compared to how much value you're actually getting for the stock, right? A company that makes $1 per share is probably worth a lot less than a company that makes, you know, $10 per share, assuming that the total number of shares out there is the same. So if you look at the graph here, um, let's just start where we are right now. This is uh, this graph was actually printed uh, maybe like two months ago, so it might be a little bit behind. But the current Schiller P.E. ratio is 32. And to kind of give you an idea of what a normal P.E. ratio would be is approximately 15. A Schiller P.E. ratio of 15 would be an average uh, price for the stock for how well the company is doing. So 
at 20, at a Schiller P ratio of 20, that usually indicates that you're in a bubble. 25 would be considered to be a very large bubble. And needless to say that a Schiller P ratio of 32 is uh, absolutely extravagant. If you compare that, it's only been anywhere near this high two times in the past. Uh, this one right here is a dot-com bubble, which um, many of you are probably too young to remember, but this was uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money in this bubble as they thought tech stocks would just go do well forever. And then after that bubble burst, uh, people lost a ton of money. So the Schiller P.E. ratio was higher than 32, obviously, at that time. It was approaching 45. Um, this right here, this little peak here, is obviously not at 32. This is somewhere around 27, and this was the 2009 bubble. So for the people that can remember what happened in 2009, this is where we were then, and this is where we are now, which is, needless to say, it's, it's much higher than that. Um, and then if you go back to the Great Depression, right before the Great Depression was the Roaring Twenties, and that only had a Schiller P.E. ratio of 30 before the uh, Great Depression happened. So in terms of bubbles, like we're definitely in one of the biggest bubbles uh, that we've ever been in. Um, and then uh, there's another graph here too. Let's just move this on over. Uh, there's something called, so Warren Buffett, um, I'm sure most of you guys know who, the, who he is, um, he created something called a Warren Buffett indicator. And this is a measure of the market capitalization, which just basically means the total worth of the stock market, which, and they compare that to how well the entire country's, um, basically how, how much money the entire country is making, which is called the gross domestic product. And you, they compare the two. So if you take the entire value of the US stock market and you take, divide it by the total income of the United States in a given year, that gives you this Warren Buffett indicator. And that's what this thing is here. So this is to total market capitalization divided by the gross domestic product. Now, Warren Buffett, this is one of his major indicators to let him know where the economy is um, in terms of bubbles. Uh, you know, how, how big the asset bubbles are compared to the uh, economic growth. And uh, for some values here is we have percentages. So if the stock market ends up going above, is it's worth more than the entire income of the entire country, obviously that would be a bubble, right? But if the stocks, total stock, stock capitalization, so the entire stock market is worth less than the entire country is making, then that would be a good time to buy because that would probably be like, you know, like a, basically you're getting stuff really cheap. And um, so this is where we are now. We're at 142%. And so 142% of the Warren Buffett indicator, and to kind of give you an idea where that would be, is if you are at 50% or less, so in this area in the 1980s, that would be a significantly undervalued, which means if you're buying stocks or other assets at this time, that um, you're getting a great deal for your money. And then 50 to 75%, this area right here is what's called moderately undervalued, meaning that if you're making purchases in this time frame, you're making you know pretty good buys. And then 70 to 90%, that means this is the stuff where it's fairly valued, like you're getting stock for a good price compared to how much growth the country is, ha is having. Once you start getting to the 90 to 115 percent area, you start getting where the stock market is worth more than the entire country is making. This is starting to get into a small bubble. Once you're at 115 percent, which is about right here, and greater, this is significantly overvalued. This just tells you that you're in a crazy bubble. And if you just draw a line across here, if you go start here where we are now in 2018, let's go all the way back to like the 1970s, you can see it only hit that time once in the past where it was significantly overvalued. And once again, this is the 2000 dot com bubble, uh, which was uh, the largest bubble that we've ever had. And then you had the crash afterwards at 75%. It was fairly priced again. This right here at 115% is letting you know that it is uh, overvalued, like significantly overvalued. Um, and this is a 2009 bubble, 2009 market crash. And I well, see 2009 bubble was really, it really peaked in 2005, 2006. And then it crashed from 2008 to 2009. You know, 2009, 2010 was kind of the bottom. Everything started working its way back up. So we're way above where the 2009 bubble was, was about here 115%, and we're all the way up at 142%. Um, if this market keeps going on for much longer, we'll end up passing the uh, stock, or sorry, the dot-com bubble in terms of uh, the Warren Buffett indicator being uh, extremely overvalued. 
back this graph up here. This next one here looks at what's called uh, the uh, Case Shiller 20, uh, 20 City Composite Home Price Index. Case Shiller, uh, specifically Shiller, was uh, the, uh, basically the guy that's behind creating indices for letting you know what the national home prices are. This one specifically looks at 20 large cities and kind of compares that. Um, across the board. So if you look here, this is basically looking at, at home prices. This is his index that he created. So, you know, in 2004, home prices started getting kicking up. Home prices peaked in 2006 area and then kind of had a little dip. And then obviously everyone remembers the 2008, 2009 bubble crash. Um, so back here, the uh, 2006 bubble peaked at, at a, a case Schiller index of 206. So that's when the housing was most expensive. And then we had the crash. Housing dipped down. 2011, I believe, was around the bottom. Um, this index specifically shows 2012. The Case Shiller index is typically two or three months behind just on how it's measured. So 2011, 2012 would have been the absolute best time to buy uh, real estate. And then we started going up from there. Currently, we are now above where the 2006 bubble was. Uh, now the Case Shiller index is at 210. And that's as of uh, April of 2018. Uh, I don't have the August data yet, but I, I suspect it will be just a little bit higher. Um, so in terms of real estate prices, real estate prices now are currently higher than the 2006 uh, bubble was and then the resulting 2008-2009 crash. And then I have one more graph here that I would like to show you guys. This is the home price to income ratio. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing. Basically, it tells you if you take the the Schiller Home Price Index and you divide it by the median annual income, it kind of gives you an idea of the affordability of housing for people. So, uh, all the way up until 2000s, you know, home prices compared to income were, were pretty stable. So, as, you know, if home prices are going up and income went up, kind of averaged out. Um, and then in 2005, obviously 2006, the home prices were way above what the uh, median income would have been for a family. So, and obviously that represented a bubble there, and then obviously it crashed down. And then we've had significant home price increases or real estate increases, um, but we've also had some increase in the uh, income as well. So in regards to affordability of how expensive the house is compared to people's income, that is not quite as bad as it was in 2006, 2007. So that's kind of kind of a plus. But um, I think all the rest of the data shows that, you know, we are significantly at the uh, end of a business cycle here. We're coming up on the end, and uh, that's why I believe that 2018, 2019 might be uh, a bad time, you know, to be fully invested uh, in the stock market or in the real estate market, or at least uh, maybe have some cash on the sidelines, so that if there is any large corrections, that you'll be prepared to take advantage of them. All right. Well, uh, you know, uh, it'd be great if you guys want to like the video or subscribe. Um, trying to start something up here. Let me know if you guys are interested in any other content or if you have any requests. Feel free to comment below and uh, thanks for coming. Bye.